If you live in Union Pacific Country, you've probably seen an old and weary Southern Pacific locomotive with a bright yellow patch, giving an old locomotive new life, coming up on JC's Rip Track. Hi there, my name is John and welcome to JC's Rip Track. If this is your first time here and you're looking for advice and tips on how to transform your plastic models into something that looks like it belongs to the rails today, click on subscribe and that little bell icon so you can be notified every time there's a new video. So what is your biggest challenge when it comes to weathering locomotives? Please let me know in the comments section below. Some of you may remember the Rock Island locomotive that was part of my 1000 subscriber giveaway earlier this year. Well, the owner of that locomotive decided to commission me to do two more locomotives for his N-Scale fleet. One was a Union Pacific SD40-2 made by Intermountain, and the other was an Atlas Southern Pacific SD35. Florent sent me several pictures of what he wanted to see, but instead of replicating a prototype, there were several things that he wanted to have on both models. The primary feature was to have a well-worn Southern Pacific locomotive that had been patched to Union Pacific service. Now if you're a rivet counter, you may want to plug your ears. The Southern Pacific SD35s were all either retired or scrapped long before Union Pacific's complex takeover, so an SD35 patched to Union Pacific is not a real-world locomotive. However, this allowed the opportunity to combine several signature features that Florent wanted onto one single locomotive, and this Atlas SD35 would be the canvas. I decided that instead of doing the two locomotives separately, I weathered them at the same time. This would save on time and resources, especially when it came between the clear coats and the steps. However, the techniques and materials that I used between the two locomotives were more often different than the same, and that's why you will see them in two different videos and you will compare it with the Union Pacific locomotive in the next video. As these were part of a commission, I posted updates to my Patreon page. You can check out some of the pictures there in addition to this video. If you click on show more below, you can find a link or wait until the end screens. Like the other locomotives that I've done in this channel, the first step is to prepare it. Remove the shell from the chassis along with the fuel tank. I also separated the main shell into two separate parts with the walkways and handrails separate from the main body. I did this by gently prying the railings away from where they would attach to the upper shell using a small flat screwdriver. Atlas locomotives can also remove the cab along with the glass, but I found that the clear plastic was not going to come away easily, so I opted to mask the windows with Tamiya Hobby masking tape and a little bit of Microscale's liquid mask. Before getting into any sort of fading step, the first order of business this time was to chip away at the original Southern Pacific logos. In my usual process, chips normally come a little later, and while I was doing more chips and rust later, what I wanted to do here was to create the illusion of the paint on the lettering that had been peeled off or worn away, exposing grey paint below it. The process that I used here is the same that I've done for chips, but the difference is that I took some time to find a match to the grey paint. Now I lucked out and discovered that one of the paints in my collection, Games Workshop Skaven Blight Dinge, was a near perfect match to the grey. I tested the paint on the underside of the walkways to check the color and make sure. Using a torn sponge, I dipped it in the paint, dabbed most of it out onto a paper towel, and then lightly dabbed it on the model, specifically anywhere where either the red paint or the white lettering might be worn away. Even though I was going to be covering this up with road numbers in the future, I still did it, largely to test to see how the chipping would look. As you can see, the end result is pretty dramatic, giving a realistic worn look to the lettering. This trick can be used on both locomotives and rolling stock as well as on structures. Just match the color of the base paint and you can create the illusion of worn or chipped lettering. Fading using the oil dot technique is virtually standard on anything that I do. Even if I use an airbrush for fading, I almost always complement it with oils. This time around, I wouldn't use the airbrush at all but this would be the first real use of the oil brusher line from Ammo by MIG. Off camera, I sprayed the locomotive with AK Interactive satin clear coat to prepare it as a first step. As I would discover, the oil brushers really saved me a lot of time. Instead of placing the oil on my palette, I was able to use them straight out of their respective bottles. I used the palette to hold the odorless thinner, but that was it. Applying the paint was very easy. 
Shake the tube, use the built-in brush to apply dots all over the model, put it back in the tube and you're done. The oil brush or colors that I used for this step were white, black, medium, gray, buff, and starship filth. As this was to create the illusion of worn and faded paint, a good way to think about it is how the light hits the model, but also where the recesses and the crevices are. Use the lighter colors towards the top, while the darker colors collect around the edges, in the grills, and the like. And then the medium colors act to blend it all together. Since this is a fade, I used mostly the lighter colors of white, buff, and medium gray, with just a few small places for the starship filth and the black. I found working with the oil brushers, I didn't need to let the dots dry for too long. I was able to start blending them almost as soon as I had finished both parts. It wouldn't have harmed it had I left it to dry for about 15 minutes, as I often do, but the consistency of the oil brusher paints means that I didn't have to let them sit as long as regular tube-based oils might. The blending is exactly what you've seen in previous videos, especially my video on the dot fade technique. Using a flat brush, I wet it with thinner and then used downward strokes to make the dots just disappear. I started with the top, working out from the middle and then moved down onto the sides and then to the separate walkways assembly. When doing a dot fade, I like to rinse the brush and thinner between clusters of strokes. This is usually why I have two wells on my palette for thinner, one for cleaning excess pigment out of the brush and one clear one to re-wet the brush after wiping it off. This makes sure you don't get too much loose pigment pooling in odd places. I let the locomotive fully dry after this step and then gave it an acrylic clear gloss coat. While I sometimes vary what I use, this was my standby of Future Floor Acrylic thinned with a bit of 91% alcohol. The acrylic clear coat would provide a barrier between the oils of the fading step from the oil enamel wash that I would be using next. For the pin wash, I decided to use my original MIG Productions dark wash for the look that I wanted. Models like this have lots of detail hiding on them and carefully applied washes can do a lot to bring out and make those tidy bits pop. The process is exactly as I've demonstrated before. Pour out some of the wash into a well on a palette, dampen the surface of the model with odorless mineral spirits, and then using a small point brush, apply the wash to the points and details of the model, allowing the pigment to collect around the raised detail, panel lines, grills, and anywhere else there's a corner. Most of the time this works by capillary action, so you don't necessarily have to draw the brush across the whole thing. You can usually just touch the brush to a point and it will flow where it needs to go, but sometimes it does need a little help. Once I had applied this to the model, it was time to let it dry for about 15 minutes or so, and then set up for the second part of the process. The main thing after doing an oil or enamel based pin wash is that there will be a lot of excess paint or wash that needs to be blended or cleaned up. Ideally, this should be done after most of the thinner on the model has evaporated. If any of the wash still looks glossy, leave it for a bit longer. With this model, I started with a paper towel to wipe away the excess and then used a larger flat brush without any thinner to soften and blend the edges of the wash. Sometimes a small amount of thinner may be necessary to blend away some excess paint, but my timing on this locomotive was just right. Up next, I airbrushed a clear coat using AK Interactive Satin Varnish thinned down with our own high compatibility thinner. The next step would be something that I had never done in this way before, and rather than going with either gloss or flat, I went somewhere in the middle, and you'll see why in a moment. After applying the pin wash, the details on this model weren't popping out as much as I would like. The deeper contrast was fine, but it was too muted. I needed something to highlight the details in the model to make it more interesting to look at, especially with all of the additional weathering that I was going to be doing. I decided to try a dry brushing or overbrushing technique, which I had done for many years, but with acrylics. This time around, I would be using oil paints. Dry brushing, at least as I describe it here, is a common technique that artists and modelers have been using for years. The process is simple. Apply a small amount of paint to a brush, wipe most of the paint off on a paper towel or some other surface, and then lightly draw the brush over the model. This leaves just a small amount of pigment that sticks to the raised parts of the model. You've likely seen this used on scenery, particularly on rock faces and the like, and it can give a realistic effect very quickly. It's good for fur, wood, shingles, brick, clothing, but at the same time, if not done well, it can look pretty grainy. I thought that if I used oil paints, I could use this technique, but then come back and soften the look and avoid the graininess that can sometimes happen. 
In setting this up, instead of using tube-based oils, I used the medium gray and white oil brushes to put some paint on the palette. Then the starting consistency right out of these bottles is just right. I dabbed a bit of paint on the palette and then used a brush to work with it. Initially I started with gray, but I decided fairly quickly to lighten it with the white to create a light gray dry brush. I applied this exactly as I just described, but because this is oil based, I can go back and then soften it with a completely dry brush. Wow, <laughs> that's confusing. So I am using a brush with a little bit of paint on it in a dry brushing technique. But then I follow it up with a brush that is totally dry, without any paint on it at all to soften what I just applied. Clear as mud? <laughs> Good. At any rate, the effect was exactly what I was looking for. It smoothed out nicely and it quickly eliminated any sign of graininess. Using Tamiya Flat Clear to protect the work of the oils, I wanted to make sure that the dry brush layer was sealed in before I went ahead with the chips and the rust. Looking at the prototype pictures, one of the things that I noticed is that the areas of heavy rust chips sometimes had these almost tan outlines around them, where the paint itself was deteriorating and flaking away. Instead of going straight to a rust color then, I started by lightly sponging on a bit of Bane Blade Brown from Games Workshop to create a few areas inside which I would then paint the chips using my usual colors of Scrag Brown and Mornfang Brown, using an extremely fine point double zero brush. I experimented first with the fuel tank and then moved on to the rest of the model once I was comfortable with how it looked. I kept some prototype example pictures nearby to make sure I was getting the signature features right. The requested signature feature for this model would be a heavy rust stain and streaking on the left side. I alternated between brush and sponge as needed and then adapted which colors I was using depending upon the picture. On the upper parts of the model, I went straight to Scrag Brown to create brighter rust chips, followed by the Mornfang Brown. Sometimes I would even paint a small amount of the Bane Blade Brown around the edge of the chips if I thought it needed it. Chipping really is a lot more art than science. The idea is to pick the colors and then work with them, alternating and rotating as necessary, always checking them against the example. Once I was happy with the result and making sure that Florent was happy with the update pictures, it was time to move on to the next step. The advantage of having a good satin clear coat at my fingertips means that I'm not just alternating between gloss and flat. The rust streaks and staining that I would be doing in the next step work well with a gloss coat, but more recently I found that a satin coat gives it just enough tooth to allow for a bit of staining within the streaks. I used AK Interactive Satin Varnish Thin with their high compatibility thinner for this step, making sure to avoid any contact with water while using it. Trust me, don't make contact with water. Using the previously applied chips as a guide, I used Abtalong 502 oil paints, light rust and dark rust to pick out the larger rusted areas that we've been showing streaks. This is my standby technique that you've seen me use in several of my videos already. The difference here is that I wanted to use a slightly thinner mix of oil paint so I could get right into some of the smaller sponged on chips. The trouble is, too thin and it will flow like a wash, too thick and it won't streak well. And sometimes I have to just experiment and play with it. Once I had applied the oils, I let the model sit for a little bit before coming back with a dry flat brush to draw down the oil paints into those convincing streaks. But I also kept a separate but damp flat brush in case I needed to manipulate the oils further. Again, it pays to keep a picture of what you're working towards handy. Up next is that yellow patch that shows that the locomotive is now in Union Pacific service. I waited to do this until after most of the weathering in the model was done. It was a quick way to show the Southern Pacific locomotives were now under the new banner without going into the expense of repainting the entire locomotive. It also gives it a really neat look. Off camera, I did an acrylic matte clear coat, and then I used it to be a hobby masking tape to protect the areas around where I would be airbrushing the patch over top of the existing road number. Masking is often tedious, but it is important to do it right. Previously, I had found that AK Interactive's yellow is a very close match to Union Pacific's armor yellow, so this would be what I would use for the patch itself. Thinning it with their high compatibility thinner, I sprayed thin layers, slowly building it up enough so that it covered the original markings. Since the next step would be applying the Union Pacific decals, I used a bit of clear gloss brush on varnish 
and I applied these to the areas where I would be applying the decals rather than over the whole model. Again, the main thing is a smooth surface for the decals to stick to. Games Workshop's art coat is very good for this, but any brush on acrylic gloss will do the trick. Florent agreed that I wouldn't be completely renumbering this locomotive, but rather reapplying the original road numbers in the Union Pacific red lettering over the yellow patch. This way I wouldn't have to redo the number boards like I would have to do on her sister locomotive. I did this with my usual method, cutting the numbers out individually, soaking them with water on the cutting mat rather than putting them into the water, and then applying and positioning them on the patch using micro set to help them set them in place. This can take time and I had to make sure that I was also wicking away the excess water so that the numbers wouldn't float out of position. I also applied Union Pacific shield decals to the nose and tail of the locomotive right over top of the road numbers. The fresh decals contrasted well with the worn look and really added some significant character to the model. After it had dried a bit, I applied some Microsol in order to make sure the decals were adhering well to the surface. This time around, I only had to do this once, which is not always the case. Using the same brush on clear gloss as I did before, I then sealed the decals to fully protect them. As the only remaining steps on the shell would be airbrushing soot and dust, I used Tamiya Flat Clear to tamp down the gloss over the decals and blend everything together. Before reassembling the shell, it was time to work on the trucks. For various reasons, I left the trucks intact on the chassis and carefully painted around any of the mechanisms. I would be not using an airbrush in these steps, so there wasn't a need to mask it off. I used the same dry brushing technique on the grey colored trucks as I had earlier in the process. I used medium grey and white oil brushers blended on a palette and then dry brushed them onto the trucks, followed by softening with a brush that was literally dry. On the trucks especially, this made a lot of the details pop, and I would let this cure for about three days before moving on to the next step, although I could have sprayed on an acrylic clear coat as well. Since the trucks on these prototype pictures I had been working on had bits of rust on them, I decided to create an on-the-surface type wash. Using Abtolung 502's light rust and dark rust oil paints, I applied small dots to certain places on the model. Next, I used a Deerfoot stippler type brush to apply thinner by dabbing it onto the surface and then letting it dissolve and blend the rust dot naturally. I tried to be careful to keep the thinner off the wheels while I did this. The end result was a kind of uneven rust wash effect that worked well with the previous dry brush step. Once the trucks had dried, it was time to bring it all back together. I reassembled the shell first, carefully reattaching the railings to the model and gently pressing everything back into place. As soot and dust was up next, I needed to do a final flat coat using Tamiya Flat Clear to make sure that it had a nice matte finish. Now, soot can be handled any number of ways, but this one was one of the few places where an airbrush makes it quick. Using Tamiya XF1 Flat Black, I started with the main stack and then lightly spraying around it, I then focused on the center of each fan and then coming back and moving up and down the center of the top of the model. This adds a realistic sooty look to the top of the model, depicting where it would collect while the train is in motion. I didn't need to do much, and it is easy to go overboard here. Less is more. Similarly, I wanted to apply a light bit of dust around the trucks in the lower parts of the model. While the trucks themselves do get quite dusty, it can also collect on the fuel tank, the walkways, and across the lower front and back of the locomotive. As with soot, less is more. I used a 50-50 mix of Tamiya XF57 Buff and XF52 Flat Earth. Once the dust was settled, it was all done. Off camera, I removed the window masks and then set it up for these photos before packaging it up with her sister locomotives and then sending them all back home. This locomotive was the second of three locomotives that Florence sent me. The first, the Rock Island locomotive, also received a bit of dust in this last step, but you've already seen most of that work in a previous video. The third one is a Union Pacific SD40-2, which I did alongside this one, and you will see how I did it in the next video. So I hope you found this helpful for your own projects. The takeaway from this is how patches can really add character to a locomotive, even though the SD35s never found their way into Union Pacific's roster. This kind of process shows how one can make that plausible just by getting some of the key points of the look. 
The newer looking patch over the heavy weathering really tells a story that is plausible, which is one of the things that we are trying to do in the hobby. This is true even if we are doing a freelance or fantasy scheme, and so this was a lot of fun to do. So if you want to get more tips on how to get the most out of your painting and weathering projects, don't forget to hit subscribe and that little bell icon so you won't miss any upcoming videos. Also, if you haven't already, check out the other videos on this channel as well as some of the social media links below. Lastly, if you like seeing how Florence Commission went and you want a chance to see how one of your own might look, go check out my Patreon page and you can get involved in the creative process for this channel. So thanks so much for watching, good luck, and may you keep on track.